Tonight, Peter Jesperson joins us to talk about managing the replacements and more. Here's your host, Dennis Ball. What is up? Peter Jesperson from Twin Tone Records. Quiet down, audience. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, my pleasure. Um, I don't know if you know, I'm a huge Replacements fan. The Replacements were the first concert I ever went to. Oh, my in God. Where was that? Did you know that? It was at the Orpheum in Boston in 1987. It was like mid-February. It was the Please to Meet Me tour. And before the show, I went to the... To strawberries in, uh, or uh, yeah, to strawberries in Kendall Square, and I waited in line with a bunch of other people in the cold, and then the band signed my cassettes. Ah, and then I went to the show that night. I was I was fourteen. Tell us this joke, Bryson, in the comments. All right. So, um, in any case, man, I have some questions for you, and then I also have questions from the Facebook group on the replacements and then I have like extra memes and jokes so let's get into it um I will just go right into it hold on I want to get a little bit of like background music going though so we have like a nice nice vibe all right so um tell can you tell me like how did you first meet the band like what do you remember the first time you heard the replacements uh well I I I uh the singer brought a cassette into the record store that I worked at and uh, you know a demo and um, asked if I'd listen to it so um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I I said of course and thank you and uh, you know this, this was is Paul Westerberg Paul Westerberg yeah it was uh, the May of I think early May of 1980 and um, you know, Twin Tone was two years old by that time, and so I was getting demos, you know, a lot of demos for Twin Tone, uh, you know, from local artists and from, you know, you know, people would mail them from other parts of the country as well, some from outside of the country even. Uh, and also we had a rock club, uh, underground music club in Minneapolis at the time called the Longhorn, um, and that had been around since June of 1977, and I was the uh, head DJ there, so... Uh, okay, no kidding. I didn't. You were the DJ at the. Did you own that place? No, I just was just the DJ and and uh, a, a, a fan. So I I was there a lot and uh, and um, so. So uh, you had an opportunity to spin a lot of the records that you were releasing at the Longhorn, and that probably became kind of a thing too, right? Well, that you know, I mean, I didn't you know overdo it with promoting you know my own the the stuff i was just the stuff i was working on but yeah we sure played the twin tone stuff and a lot of the twin tone bands played there but it was um you know through my you know relationship with the club owners and the book owner uh the booker i um i had a little bit of sway in booking bands so uh sometimes bands were giving me demo tapes to get a gig at the longhorn sometimes people were giving me tapes to audition for twin tone and i didn't always know what you know why they were giving me the tape and that was the case yeah. with Westerberg. I, he gave me the tape and I, I, I frankly I didn't get to it right away because I was a little bit backed up and busy at the store and other things and you know so I, I finally did some catching up and listened to a bunch of the tapes that I was behind on including the replacements and I was just absolutely knocked out by it and when I called no him up kidding. I said um, you know I, you, you, you gave me four songs I like them all were you thinking of doing a, a, a 45 uh, or were you looking to do a full album? And there was a long pause, and he said, and I quote unquote, he said, "You think this shit is worth recording?" And uh, it turned out he was just wow. giving me the tape to try to get a gig at the Longhorn. So I said, "Well, I could certainly help you get a gig at the Longhorn too, I think, but uh, I, I'd also like to talk to you about making some records." So that's how that began. And what was the what were the four songs? Uh, well, let's see. The first one was called Raised in the City, which we re-recorded for the Starry yes. My album. Uh, second yeah. one was called Shut Up, which we also re-recorded. Yes! But... I'm trying not to break into song, Peter. Don't <laughs> keep it going. <laughs> and then a song called Don't Turn Me Down, uh, and a song called Sh- uh, Shape Up. Uh, and, uh, the other two, yeah, we didn't end up, uh, you know, they weren't on the first record. I don't think I've ever heard those two songs. Yeah, they've been on. Uh, well, I put them on. Um, 
uh, the uh, there was a, a series of reissues, CD reissues I did, I produced for Rhino in 2008, and we put the tracks on those, and then we also did a big box set, uh, 40th anniversary of Sorry Ma last fall. Uh, I had 100 tracks on it, 67 what? unreleased tracks. Uh, did you release that on vinyl? Uh, four CDs and one piece of vinyl in the box. And uh, okay. those four demos that Paul first gave me are also in that set. Oh, man, I should get that because that's... I actually named... When I did my video about ranking the Replacements albums, that was the number one song. One. Um, all right, hold on a second. There's some people in the chat I want to say hi to. Bryson um, started to talk about... Uh, he started to tell a joke, but it was terrible, so I'm not going to read it. Sorry, Bryson. You can tell it later. What's up? Georgia Constitution Media is in the house. Yo, ya 420. What's up? Yo, ya 420. Maybe it's Nito is in the house. He said he can't hardly wait for tonight's episode, uh, Peter. Scummy Mummy is in the house. Um, thank you. Um, and Paper Bag Man is in the house. Jilly ba Beans, what's up? Jilly Beans is a new subscriber, so I think she might be here just to see you, Peter. Oh. And um, cool. All right, so welcome everyone. I want to continue talking to Peter because I I feel like I I feel bad for making him wait for me to do all of that, but you know I want to say hi to everybody. So Can um, I ask Peter, a question. Yeah. Is that red chair comfy? It is. I mean, it's kind of chafes my ball. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I it is comfy though. You as you can see here, I was listening to "Let It Be" before the program. I see that. When the replacements um, told you they wanted to name a record "Let It Be," like, how did you react to that? Did you think that was a bad idea or a good idea or what? Uh, well, uh, no. I mean, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was funny. I mean, it was a, just. It was sort of a, a, a yet another perfectly replacements esque thing to do, and. Um, I had uh, become accustomed to that sort of uh, uh, behavior from them. So I thought it was amusing. And I said, sure, why not? You know, you can't and, copyright yeah. a title. Yes. And you're and I know you're a huge Beatles fan. So it like, you know, it's done with love, I'm sure, too. I think it was a little bit of a poke at me because they thought, uh, you know, Westerberg, you know, would say, hey, Peter, you know, they're not the be all and end all. They're a great rock and roll band, but they're not, you know. Whereas for me, you know, they are the be all and end all. I file my records Beatles first and then the alphabet starts, you know, so I think they are, uh, you know, I think they're a cut above, but, um, but you know, that's- Damn, I love opinion. that. I, I, first of all, I completely agree with you. Secondly, I love that you file your records Beatles first and everything afterwards. I kind of do that too. You know, I did that starting when I was a kid and I, I never even thought about it. And then I remember actually going over to a friend's house and looking at his records and, you know, when, you know, we started out, you know, we would have just a handful of records, but when you started to build an actual collection, I remember seeing, he had the Beatle records in the bees. And I remember kind of going, wait, that, I don't understand. That. <laughs> yeah, they don't have their own. Okay. All right. Now we're getting, what's your, um, hold on. So when I did, speaking of my video, when I ranked the replacements records, what, um, you had some corrections for me on that. I did. I did have some corrections. Um, uh, I have my notes right here. You had said that Stink was originally a seven inch, which it was not. I think that um, possibly you were confused by the fact that it was a forty. It was forty five RPM. Yes. Yes. Um, it was a. It was a twelve inch forty five. And did you uh, did you do any of the hand stamping of those? Because uh, they kind of handmade those. I did most of it, uh, or not most of it, but Are I did you? lots of it. You know, we had, Hold on. you know, me That's and the band like. and, uh, you know, other fr friends, you know, it, it, we had to do, you know, we did a couple thousand the first pressing and then we had to make more. And so, you know, we had different groups of people stamping those jackets. These things are extremely sought after now. Yeah. I did you, to, did you to, save have, a couple for your archives? I, I do. I have the rubber stamps sitting here in a box behind me too. Do you, can you get it? No, um, just kidding. I, I, can you get it really? I can. Okay, while you're getting it, I'm gonna say um, hi, paper bag man. Um, Georgia Constitution Media, what's up? Yeah, this is cool, right? Um, very cool stories already, and we haven't even really gotten that far into it. P maybe it's Nito says his wife and he are huge Mats and Westerberg fans. 
Um, we are two. In my house, we are two. Um, we were listening to Replacements records like quite a bit this this last three years. Actually, I bought, I rebought all my al my Replacements albums on vinyl, um, just because I just needed them again. You know, that's what I had them. I have them all on CD, but then when I saw there were new press, new releases on Rhino, I, I just needed to get the nice. All right, he's Peter's getting out the stamp for that he used for stink. Yeah, ho, let me see. Hold on, I'm gonna go to the other view so that you can see it better. One second. Yeah, there it is. It, uh, the handle. I unscrewed the handle because I packed them up in plastic bags. Yeah, That's kind of incredibly cool, Peter. Wow. There's, uh... Hold that up higher. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's the track listing. Hold on. I'm going to make myself go away. Hold on a second. That is so cool, Peter. Hold on. I'm going <laughs> to. That is so cool. Thank you sure. for for doing that. Um, all right. So. Stink was Nito's first album. So, Nito, you must think that's pretty cool. That Can you believe that he has the stamps for that? That's wild. Um, all right, so I'm so distracted. What's your favorite Replacements record, Peter? Well, I would have to say Let It Be, but um, I, li I love them all. I mean, you know, I... I uh, uh, yeah, I, I love them all for different reasons. Um, uh, I, you know, I think that the least great replacements record is Don't Tell a Soul. Um, I, agree, I think yeah. the best replacements record is Let It Be. Uh, I think the first four, you know, and this sounds like I'm biased because those were the records I was most involved in, but I think the first four are the strongest. And I think that uh, Tim, Pleased to Meet Me, Don't Tell a Soul, and All Shook Down are great records, but they have uh, they're sp a little spotty. I think they have songs on them that uh, I don't think are a hundred percent successful. Right, right. I mean, I agree with you, though. I have a soft spot for both. Please to meet me and Tim. Oh, uh, I mean, but I, I love think them. I love them. Don't get me wrong. And I, but know, I feel, in a way, I think yeah. all shook down is. I mean, I think the song all shook down is sort of the pinnacle of Westerberg's writing for the replacements. I think that song is just, you know, beyond brilliant. His ballads are are so raw and um, vulnerable. They're they're incredible and just well delivered. I mean, I'm not. We don't. We we'll we could get deep into that. But um, all right. So hold on a second. Oh, great. Okay. So before we get, I have a couple more, and then I'm gonna go into the people. But here's a good one. What's a positive, memorable moment that you shared with the replacements that most people don't know about? Um, uh, boy, you guys must have had some good times where you've like celebrated your successes. Oh, and yeah. Stuff. Um, I would actually say, you know, one of the great moments for all for all of us was, um, well, um, we played, uh, there was a club down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina that we played a handful of times called, uh, the Cat's Cradle. Yes. And I remember after a show there that was extremely oh, how do you like that? Oh my gosh, it's Paul Westerberg calling today and don't don't talk trash about me. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. It's uh anyway it, Cat's Cradle, Cat's Cradle. It was yeah. a particularly crowded show and um and uh afterwards I was sitting up in the office with the owner uh and he was uh you know doing the receipts and counting money and, and getting ready to pay me. And when he tallied everything up, he just kind of casually said, wow, you guys uh, took the attendance record for the club tonight. And I wow, said, that's wow, fun. you know, because I, I mean, I'd heard about the cat's cradle long before I ever went there. And so it was quite an honor, you know, to hear that from the owner. And then I said, of course, who had it, you know, before me, uh, or who, who had it before the replacements rather. And he said NRBQ, and uh, there were probably maybe only two bands uh, during the entire time that uh, I traveled with the replacements that everybody liked. If you put them on in the van, nobody complained. And those two bands were Big Star and NRBQ. So that's how. Mm -hmm. So we were huge NRBQ fans. So I I just rushed out of there, you know, back down to the 
you know, the, the room where the stage was and the band was packing up the gear and stuff while I'd been up getting paid. And I just said, you're not going to believe it. Guess who we just stole the attendance record from. So there was a big, you know, that was a big kind of high five moment. That really is. That's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Hold on one second here. Um, uh, let it be. Okay. So let it be. I just have to ask you about the, um, the let it be like that roof shot that roof were you there for that photo shoot no i was not there for that photo shoot i that is just that was done during the day i was probably at the record store you know i was uh and i you know that dan corrigan shot those pictures uh, there's we did a couple of shoots for the record cover uh, a guy named greg helgeson took some pictures and then dan corrigan ended up taking these uh and uh the roof the roof shot so, you no. know it would you know you know it would be cool. I'm just I'm just throwing this out there because I thought it was cool when they did this on the Let It Be box. Like if you did a like say you did a Let It Be um, Super Deluxe. I don't know if you have yet, but like say you did a like an alternate mix or like what the original mix was or something. You could do another cover like the first cover you didn't use. You know what I mean? Like use a different cover. Yeah. Well, there's it's the, kind of uh, cool. Yeah. There's the you know there was the 12 inch um, of I Will Dare that was a black and white outtake from that roof shot. So we've already done that. I used that idea. But yeah, it, it would it would be a good one. There hasn't been a replace uh, a Let It Be box yet. Um, the fact is, there isn't a lot of extra material for Let It Be. There's just a handful of extra songs on that one. Um, largely because, you know, we were touring so much at the time that they didn't have the massive amount of tracks. Like, you know, that was what was so interesting about doing this Sorry Ma box last year was, you know, we took about, I don't know, we started recording the record really in July of 1980 and we didn't finish until, you know, we probably stopped recording in february so it was about six seven months and you know and plus you know as everybody says you know you got your whole life to write your first record so um yeah right and you, and you got what two months to write your second one <laughs> right or, or, yeah right and so uh so anyway they're just you know there were a lot of extra songs from the uh sorry ma record you know obviously not so many from stink because we did that fast um this are there tons of like um cover recordings because i know the band love to play covers live yeah yeah i mean you know again those are a lot of covers on the uh reissues we've done with bonus tracks so yeah yep yeah. and i and i loved the live at Wa maxwell's record i don't know if you you helped with that but that was a really well done project yeah i i thought that was a really i thought that was good too i um i uh yeah i think that all right was a hold little bit the the, I, I, I mean, as great as it is, I think it was the tail end of Bob's time in the band. And I think that there was a little less of a four part chemistry going on on that record. As good as it is, I think that there's, you know, there's uh, other live recordings that are stronger of that original lineup with Bob Stinson. Right. He was not at his best there. Um, hold on a second. I want to look at just. I just want to sh open the timeline really quickly. So like you, what did, did you, when basically when they went to Sire is when you stopped working with the band. Is that correct? No. Well, I worked with them through the Sire rec that first Sire record, the Tim album uh, came out in October of 85. And uh, I stopped working with them in, I guess it would have been April of 86. Right. Right. And, um, I mean, I love. I think Tim is a great record. I know you were saying it's not your favorite, but I mean, I thought Tommy Ramone uh, did a great job. I know you don't call him Tommy Ramone because you know him as a real person and not as a Ramone. What's his last name really? Erdely. Tommy. Tommy Erdely. That's right. So you know he 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 obviously ballers. Tommy Ramone re uh, produced Tim, which was news to me. Even as a replacements fan, somehow I didn't know that, or at least I didn't retain it. But then when I watched the documentary, um, Color Me, uh, where is the, th yeah, Color Me, Obsessed. is this it? Obsessed, that's not it. I have the cover of it, I was Color trying to Obsessed. show it. Color Me Obsessed. Yeah, exactly, which I highly recommend fans see. Um, you know, 
in any case, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I was trying to find the graphic for Color Me Obsessed, but um, but in any case, um, about Tommy Erdely and, and oh yeah, yeah, he played the he said he played the solo on Kiss Me on the Bus, but you said you didn't realize that. Well, that... I I wasn't there for the whole session of that one. That was one where the band kind of wanted to, you know, you know, I'd been sort of dad for a long time, and I think at that point they wanted to, you know, do it without dad present. Oh man. So I was there for a bunch of it, but I, I just wasn't there the day they worked on Kiss Me on the Bus. Right. You don't want to make out with a girl on the bus in front of a dad, your dad. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually, I have to tell you, that was my me and my girlfriend's song back in the day Aww. when I was in when I was in high school. All right. Um, hold on a second. All right. Cool. Let's look at the. There was this Facebook group called Paul Westerberg and the Replacements, and they were very kind enough to like give me a bunch of questions for you. So I'm gonna give them to you. And if you you can a take however long you want to answer them, or you can tell them to go to hell if you don't want to answer. I it. won't tell anybody to go to hell, but yeah. All right, Shoot. hold on. Shoot, Bob. Um, this one, jeez, they went right into it. Did you know that Bob was as troubled as he actually was, or did you think he was just eccentric? And do you think that they made the right decision in kicking him out of the band? Well, I mean, that's a very complicated question. I I, I mean, I think that he um, he was eccentric. Uh, and, you know, I, I think a lot of people are troubled and um, deal with it in, in different ways. Um, you know, Bob's, you know, it's really, that is a tough one. I mean. Yeah, I know. That's a, I don't mean to no, put no, you on the spot. Right. I mean, you know, he was a teddy bear of a guy, but, you know, he loved his, he loved his liquor and he loved to do drugs. And, you know, sometimes he did too much. And I think that kind of, you know, when you've got a, a bit of a troubled you know, mind, you know, that can exacerbate some of those things. And, um, but, uh, yeah. but, you know, you think I, he I, had I loved his sadness. And... I loved his eccentricity. And, um, as far he as he was a fun, he wore a dress a lot on stage, right? Sure. Sometimes he wore nothing on stage. Um, oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I didn't mean to go on, I mean to gasp. Hold on. He did? He was naked on stage? Sure. Yeah, San Diego was uh, was a place where Bob played naked. So every time we went back there, people wanted Bob to play naked again, and he'd often uh, comply. But um, you know, he had the guitar positioned in the right spot to you know. Right. Yeah, it covers things up. That's right. true. But, That's um, true. But as far as you know, whether it was a, the right idea to you know uh, have him you know leave the band, uh, you know I. Um, uh, I think that he was uh, losing the thread a little bit. I think that Paul was writing different kinds of songs that didn't appeal to Bob. There was a period where I remember more than once Paul would bring a song to a recording session and Bob would say, save that for your solo record, Paul, that ain't the replacements. Oh, geez. So... But, I mean, he wasn't writing any material himself, was he? Yeah, there was some that he, you know, there were group compositions where, you know, the, there were Paul Westerberg songs, and then there were Westerberg, Stinson, Stinson, Mars songs. Oh, okay. There were okay. a few Westerberg, Stinson, Mars songs when Bob wasn't involved, and it was just the other three. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, Bob just, I think Bob wanted to just rock all the time, and Paul wanted to do other stuff, and he wanted to, you know, uh you know, and not like that Bob I was, didn't want to grow, but he, he, you know, he, Bob was a rocker. That's what Bob wanted to do. Right. Right. I can see that. Yeah. It just was maybe unnecessary. People grow apart, like musically, just like any other way. Yeah. But and, I mean, I know that. Um, and interestingly, I think, you know, they, they, you know, they had one of this, you know, one of the most unique human beings I've ever known playing lead guitar in the first half of their career. And then they hired Slim Dunlap, who is also one of the most unique human beings I've ever known. Um, so I thought that was kind of uh, appropriate in a way. And of course, you know, Bob Dunlap, Slim Dunlap, I, I'd known him long before the replacements came along. He was, he was a, a full sort of quote unquote generation ahead of the replacements. He was in the first band that I signed to Twin Tone in 1978. So uh, he was, oh, he's, he, he's one of my favorite, you know, Slim Dunlap's one of my favorite musicians in the history of music. So, 
Um, what was the band? What was the band that you signed? They were called Thumbs Up, and the singer was a guy named Kurt Almstead. He went under the name Curtis A, and Bob Dunlap was his right hand man. Slim, yeah. I mean, I I absolutely love um, "Please to Meet Me." I know that you know it's not in your trilogy of best records, but oh no, I, um, I mean, I think "Please to Meet Me" is the best sounding replacements record too. I think Jim Dickinson did a miraculous job with that. And, you know, it's got, I mean, for God's sakes, Alex Chilton could be the best song they ever wrote or recorded. Oh, some of them give me the chills. And I mean, of course, I mean, just seeing them play live with him for the first time was formative for me. So I have a special place in my heart for him. And does your connection with Slim kind of brought you back around to... Uh, you know, you helped him out with some, he, he doing some, they did some, you did a record, uh, songs for Slim. Yeah. So brought you back around to working with the band again a little bit, huh? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I was only kind of estranged from the band from 86 until about, I don't know, 88. And then, you know, we started hanging out again and, and, uh, you know, so it's, it was a blip in time. It was, it was just, yeah, you know, it was, it, it's like I said, you know, everybody's got to move out of their parents' house at some point. And, and I think that's yeah. the, uh, that's the kind of the analogy there. They, they needed to move out of, uh, you know, they were leaving Twin Tone, they were on Sire and they just wanted a fresh start. So, yep. You know, it, it was, they were like, screw, they were like, we're moving on. This is our new boyfriend, Tommy Ramone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, hold on a second. We have just a couple of comments I want to read. Nito said Bob had a big heart, and he felt he was a big brother to the other guys. You could tell he loved him. Do you, them? No, oh, Bob I think that did was have true. a big heart. He, he uh, um, he, and um, let's see here. Yes, hit the like button. That's right, Benjamin the Eminem General. What's up? Yes, that's right. Ned Byrne says that wasn't "Let It Be" is a classic album cover. And you're right, it is a good idea about the alternate cover. But, like, Peter had already told me that they already did it. So, I guess it was a good idea. Oh, okay, yo, yeah, no sweat, man. Come back. You, it's going to be on replay, too. Okay, hold on. Let's go back. Let's continue. I'm just so into this. I hope that I'm not dragging this out forever, but it's fun talking to you. Oh, this is a rough one. What's your biggest disappointment about the replacements? Craig Daniel asked. Uh, biggest I know that's hard. I mean, I guess... Uh... I, I, I just that that uh, they weren't recognized when they were still together. I mean, I think it's uh, it's interesting that in a way they're more popular in 2022 than they were when they were together. And I, I think that that's, yeah. you know, I think that's a sad thing. Um, uh, yeah, that was. Not, yeah, I, I, I couldn't. You know, I mean, back in those days, I mean, Twin Tone, we really felt like what we were was sort of a to use a baseball analogy, uh, a farm team for the majors. And we were fine with that. You know, we would you know, maybe be the guys that would find the diamonds in the rough and we'd do a record or two with them and then they'd go to a major label and and um, and we were fine to hand them off. And uh, and with the replacements, I was astounded that we made four records with them before the majors actually, uh, you know, took the plunge and started making serious offers. So um, it, to me, it was it was it was disappointing that uh, you know that they didn't uh you know go further like i said when they were together and uh but man they were also you know they were those... difficult to work with and and uh you know so i understand in a lot of cases there were people that that knocked on their door that were interested in working with them and then when the band uh you know weren't behaving properly or cooperatively you know the major label rep walked away so that's right that's just the way it went so yeah i can see that yeah. um but i mean i have to say like just looking at the timeline i'll pull it up real quick thank god that you made those records because those are freaking sorry ma forgot to take out the trash is killer stink is just like a punch to the gut it is an amazing and it's funny, I thought for many years that it was a live album because of the intro from the show that you guys right. put in there. And then Hoot Nanny is just, first of all, so clever album cover. But, like, He's I just love those. You know. Yeah, yeah, yes. And you know, Which is and great. You know, Did, you know who designed that cover? 
Who? Boot Nanny for the replacements. It was uh, Grant Hart from Husker Du. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's, um, our... name, it says designed by fake name graphics, and that was Grant's little pseudonym. Dang. The more you know. One and of then, of course, love it about, about Hoot Nanny when we first, uh, you know, were circulating it after we'd finished it and, and we're getting ready to put it out. I, uh, uh, Somebody I, I was close to in Minneapolis music uh, called me up and said, you know, this sounds like a compilation album. Uh, various artists compilation album but it's by it's all but it's all by the same artist so i thought that was a good one yeah that's great i actually love i love it i love the little beatles reference in there yeah. i don't know if that was him towards you oh yeah that was uh actually that was uh mr Worley, and that was um that was a you know it was it was kind of a combination of um oh darling and uh um uh, the, uh, the twist. twist. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. And um, but uh, Mr. Worley was actually uh, an engineer producer guy that we worked with a little bit uh, by the name of Brian Paulson. And um, we used to joke about it sometimes when uh, you'd had too much to drink and the room would spin. You know, that meant, oh, Mr. Worley showed up. So, uh, Mr. Worley. so I, think at, oh, I, think at, I think at some point, Brian Paulson maybe uh, had an encounter with Mr. Worley. And so uh, that's where that song came from. Yeah. Nito says that's the second album he heard. I, yeah, new Hootenanny too. Uh, basically it was like, once I, once I got, once I started buying replacements records, I quickly learned that the twin tones records were the good ones. And then I just bought them all. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, you know, I would just look for that Twin Tone logo, Peter. And then I, okay, I'm going to, and then I'm just real quickly. And then later I heard that you were like putting out a Jack Logan album. And if you, if, if you guys, I'm just, as a quick aside, if you haven't heard Jack Logan, um, get his album, uh, Bulk, and then possibly get his other album Peter did called Mood Elevator. Um, they're incredible. Bulk is like a two album collection of like raw. It's almost like if Nebraska by Bruce Springsteen was done by, I don't know, a different guy in a different, but different vibe, but different state. But it's like a lot of it. <laughs> like our, so 15 years in Indiana is still lodged in my mind firmly. Um, that's an incredible song. That was the song that, uh, made that whole project happen uh logan had uh Jeez. i had nagged him for a long time i was working with a bunch of bands in athens georgia and uh one of the bands i worked with was doing a song called um what was it called the pawnbroker and uh i i i i made a comment about liking the lyrics and the guy who the, was the singer of the band he said oh well i i didn't write the lyrics for that one that's written by this guy jack logan and i said who's jack logan and he was, I'd been around Athens a lot by that time, and he was flabbergasted that I didn't know who Jack Logan was. And he said, Jack Logan's got more songs than any other single person I've ever known. And he went on and on and on about him. And then I had other people tell me raving about Jack Logan. And so finally I met him and I said, geez, you know, I'm with a record label and I'd love to hear some of your stuff. And he didn't send me any. And then I, next time I was down in Athens, I'd run into him again and I'd give him my card and I'd say, please, I really want to hear your stuff. Send me some stuff. And he wouldn't send me anything. And I thought, now this is a fascinating way to get an A&R guy's attention. He asked for music, right. you don't send him any. So finally, Logan broke down, <laughs> sent me a package. I received it in the mail when I was back in Minneapolis and it had three 90 minute cassettes full. And I kind of, at first I was like going, oh, what a dope, he doesn't get it. That's not what you, that's not how you approach a record label. You should send them three or four songs. If they like them, then, you know, they'll ask you for more, yeah. then you give them more. But uh, it was so over the top, I just laughed about it. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna check this out. And one time I was going on a road trip, actually driving, it was in 1993, I was driving from Minneapolis down to Columbia, Missouri to see that first big star reunion. Yeah. College down there in Columbia. And so I had a lot of time on the road, obviously. So I brought a big box of cassettes to listen to. And at one point I was at a gas stop in Iowa or wherever I was. And and uh, and I, I thought, what should I listen to now when I get back on the road? And I thought, I'm gonna try one of these Jack Logan cassettes and I randomly just picked one. And in fact, it's 
funny you should mention it. It's sitting right here. No um, shit. And the first song. Hold on... it up. I want to see the. Can I see the cut? So I'm sorry. I can't read it anyway. Don't worry about it. Okay. Oh, um, okay. I, that's funny coincidence that it was sitting there. Anyway, um, the first song, and it was 15 Years in Indiana, and I just went, oh, my God. And then the oh. second song came on, and that was great, and the, se and the next, and the next. And, uh, you know, obviously, three 90-minute cassettes, it was, I think, around 100 songs all told. They weren't all great, but I'd say 75% of them were great. It just absolutely blew my mind. And uh, so, so we decided that, um, you know, we wanted to make a record together, and I said, you know, I would love to go into the studio and, and record, you know, uh, in a proper studio. You know, all, all of these recordings that he had given me on tape were like home four track things that he'd done yeah, on a four track yeah. cassette machine with his buddies. You know, like on the weekend, they'd get together, like instead of going fishing or going to the ball game, they get together and, you know, do four track recordings and. And uh, so I, I think that initially Logan was excited about getting a record deal, but then he thought, you know, he'd go into a recording studio and record properly. And I said, you know what I'd like to do for your first record is take these four track recordings and, you know, pick the best songs and put out a whole bunch of them to sort of, you know, to be your first record. <laughs> so I said, I'd like to listen to everything that you've got on tape. And he went, oh, no, you don't. And I said, no, I really do. And he said, well, OK. So he started giving me tape after tape after tape. Every time I went down to Athens, I'd get another handful of cassettes. I'd take them back to Minnesota and I'd listen to them. By the end of that, I had listened to about 600 songs. Jeez. And uh, so anyway, we decided we were going to whittle it down to something manageable. And um, I uh, ended up whittling it down to 42 songs. And we did a double CD and called it Bulk. And, yeah, you uh, gotta. Wow, have you ever thought about doing a bulk super deluxe? <laughs> we have, we have thought about it. We talked to the Numero Group, actually, a great reissue company based in Chicago, about doing that, and it just fell through for uh, various reasons. Uh, so I would love to do uh, a deluxe bulk, and I would love to do all those tracks on vinyl. I mean, I did arrange them yeah. sides. If you look at the track listing, they're arranged into nine different sides. So we could do a hell of a vinyl box set too if we ever have the opportunity. But uh, all right, l let's get back to the replacements. That was a good little. That was uh, that he's. I loved him, and and you were the reason I checked him out. Just so you know, I saw that you had you were doing the record, and it was on Twin Tone, and I was like, I'm buying this. I went to a record store and I said, I want to get this record, uh, this CD. And the guy said, I have to special order it. And he special ordered it. This is pre-internet ordering ballers. And he ordered it. And I waited until the day it came in. and I, I Or I kept checking in. And then one day it was there. And I got it. Like, that's how hardcore, man. I was there for it. All right, hold on Very a second. Cool. I just want... Yeah, I just want to know that... I want you to know that. Um, do you still have the original demo that Paul gave you when you were working in the record store? Edward Dunbar wants to know. Well, I do. I mean, I, I still I still own it, but it's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at the moment in Cleveland on loan. <laughs> Whoa! Yes! Good, cool, good answer. All right. Um, Gordon Gunn has an incredibly cool name, and he wants to know... What were some of your suggestions to the mats when the band started out? That's slang for replacements, ballers. Uh, like when you first started out, like what were your suggestions to the band, or did you just let them run wild? Well, I mean, I you know I I wanted them to you know be themselves and do what they were doing, but um I guess um you know one of the things I said was uh, when we were amassing the group of songs that would make up the first album that became Sorry Ma, I said, you know, what we do need to do, besides thinking about what songs we put on an album, we have to think of what the single's gonna be. And I think that the cool thing to do for a new band is to do a single from your first album with the A side being from the album and the B side being a non-LP song, and you put it in a nice picture sleeve, and that's just a great way you know, to launch a career. And yeah. so that's what, you know, the, they, they thought that was a cool idea. And uh, while we were working on Sorry Ma, uh, I had started to hear some of these crazy solo home demos that Westerberg was doing. Um, 
And I thought those were really, really good. And they were very different. They were solo acoustic guitar and solo piano songs. I said, hey, what if we take, what if we do one of those for the B side of the single from Sorry Ma? It'd be a, you know, we, in fact, I said, I think that the single from Sorry Ma should be the song I'm in Trouble, a great rocker, great catchy mm -hmm. rocker. For the flip yeah. side, let's put one of your uh, solo songs on. And at first, Paul resisted saying, you know, kind of like what Bob was saying later on, you know, that ain't the replacements. And, um, but I, 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 I persisted and Paul finally called me up one day when we were actually, Paul and I were supposed to be going to the studio to work on mixing Sorry Ma. And he said, hey, I got an idea for that B-side. And he played me, a, I, I stopped, uh, I, went, I was going to pick him up to go to the studio anyway. So why don't you come a little earlier? Yeah. And I, so I went, I was still living with his parents at the time. So I went in and, and he uh, played me the first verse of um, a song called If Only You Were Lonely on, oh. uh, on cassette. And then he played me a second verse. I love that guitar. song. And then he uh, he ended up. Uh, I I said I think this is fantastic. Let's let's record it. And so he uh, kind of put the finishing touches on the song while we were driving to the recording studio. And uh, we got to the studio, and in ten minutes we had the track down. If only you were lonely. Is that on Stink? It's not on an album. It's on. Oh, I have a cassette that's called boink it's a compilation boink was a british and compilation that. yeah and it's a, that was the first time it was on uh, a, a 12 inch you know an lp and so yeah i i don't even know why but i like never was clued into the singles i think i now i have some things i need to track down um all right here's the next one you know i will dare oh. has a great uh, b-side too uh they did a version of t-rex's 20th century boy and uh and also Hank Williams, Hey, Good Looking, two songs. Though. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I Will Dare single. Hey, there's Matt Tomich. I know Matt Tomich. Matt says, Matt, aside, apart from signing the band, what's one thing you would do again? And what's one thing you, you know, do the same? And what's one thing you would do differently? And then the other part, half of his question is, what was the band's impression of their own records? Were they happy with Tim? Okay, well, leave that up because I won't remember what all the questions are. If okay, yes, yeah, so I'm going to leave them up right so, here. Uh, anyway, hi, Matt. How are you? Um, hey, Matt. Aside from signing the band, what is one thing I'd do again? Um, uh, um, well, I, I mean, I, I think that we, uh, you know, there was a funny thing with, you know, I've worked on a lot of records uh, with different artists in my life and... Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you know, you don't get it right. You know, you, you, you work at something and you make some mistakes or whatever. But for me with the replacements, I just had a really, uh, I felt like I had a, a, you know, for my part of it, you know, and they were the artists. I was just, you know, the A&R guy and, and uh, you know, the record label guy. But, uh, you know, I felt like I could sort of see in black and white what they should and shouldn't do. And um, so I think you know, I think we made the right moves all along, um, you know, taking the time that we took to make Sorry Ma because, you know, they were new to the studio and they were, it took them a while to get comfortable and to let their guard down and to not feel like they were under a microscope. So we really, we worked on that record for a long time and I thought that was the right thing to do. So I'm very happy about that. Or, yeah. you know, on the flip side of it, you know, to do Stink, you know, they had played a version of kids don't follow when we were in Chicago in January of 82. And, you know, we had just put sorry Ma out about five months before. So they weren't really, it wasn't time for them to be making a new record. But when I heard kids don't follow this version, they did at this club in Chicago, I, it was just monstrous. And we were actually driving home the next day back to Minnesota and we're listening to a tape of the show in the van and when Kids Don't Follow came on, you know, on the tape, I just went, we've got to put this out right away. This is, you know, this is an anthem. So good. And so I yeah. twisted my Twin Tone partner's arms into, you know, making a record much sooner than the replacements were really entitled to make a second record. And, of course, we did it on the cheap. We recorded fast. We hand stamped the jackets. You know, we only put eight songs on it, you know. Uh, so I thought that was the right move. You know, we did took our time on the first record. We did the second one fast. You know, those, those were good moves. Um, as far as what mm -hmm. I would do differently, um, um, uh, God, uh, 
I, I, I guess I wish that we had been able to get the band out of town sooner. I didn't, I think I was remiss in not working harder to, you know, get them to New York or Los Angeles, for instance. I mean, you know, the first time we really toured was April of 83, you know, so by that time, you know, I'd been working with the band for three years. I mean, I wish, I guess, that I would had the foresight to be quicker about getting them on the road. Uh, as far as what was the band's impression of their own records, you know, they all had different thoughts. Um, but I think generally speaking, they were happy with Sorry Ma. I think Westerberg is dismissive of Stink, and I totally disagree with him. I, I, he mm -hmm. says uh, he said in interviews, I don't know if he's changed his mind in recent years, but back in the day, he used to say he thought that was kind of a throwaway. I disagree. I think goddamn job and, you know, besides kids don't follow, I think goddamn job and fuck school. I mean, those are great, funny punk rock songs. Yeah. And they were they were unbelievable live. I mean, those those when they would do those live, they would bring down the house. I don't think there's any I don't. Think there's anything God, I thought that was so freaking cool when I was a teenager. I was out of my mind once stink. Yeah. So And then the last question um, of Matt's was were they happy with Tim? I mean, I think everybody was frustrated with Tim and you know, we love Tommy Erdley, but you know, he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, he loved the idea of working for Warner Brothers and producing bands for Warner Brothers, so he wanted yep. to please them, but then he also loved the replacements and he wanted to please them. So it was a, a catch 22 really and um so i think that that record um i think there's a couple songs on it that are, are not great that i would take off i would have taken off if i had been in charge of that one um, yeah but i but i think for the most part the songs are great obviously it's got you know uh swing and party and it's got left to the dial and it's got here comes little Frank, mascara you know, those are, you know those are arguably you know uh, uh you know uh you know, you could argue that any one of those is the best song the replacements ever did. Um, but um, so bottom line, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think people were ultimately 100 percent happy with Tim when it came out. OK, um, what's in the can? Mitch wants to know, meaning what's coming up? And I pro you probably can't say, but is there, do you want to tease anything that's in the can? There isn't really anything to talk about right now as far as what's coming up. And, you know, we've already, um, you know, we've already really, uh, you know, like the Sorry Ma project. I mean, I, I went through every, I turned over every rock. I mean, I keep all of that, re excuse me, all that replacement stuff, all the recordings are things I hung on to absolutely everything. So to do the Sorry Ma box, I mean, that was exhausting. To put together wow. so we've already dug very deep for uh please to meet me uh don't tell a soul and uh and sorry ma and you know so you know maybe there will be uh you know i i mean i think that there there could be a a, a series of live uh replacements releases uh a yeah lot of those right have circulated on bootlegs so you know it wouldn't be a big deal to the super fans who already have the bootlegs but you know some of those bootlegs are 10th generation you know 20th generation cassette dubs so i've got the most of those i've got the originals of and so i could you know if we if we did something like that we could make better sounding you know versions of those bootlegs that you know some of the super fans already have do you like store those in some kind of climate control or any kind of? Do you worry about yeah, that I kind do. of stuff? I keep them in a place that's that's uh, you know I don't. It's not like I have a fancy vault with climate control, but right. I keep them in a place where it's cool and dark. Yeah. Right. Awesome. All right. That was a good question, um, Matt T. Um, all right, Mitch. Oh yes, that was Mitch's question. Patty says. Um, and you, this is kind of goes into what you were talking about before with like kind of what was disappointing. Well, in your opinion, why did you think that Matt's always teetered on the brink of success but never made it big? Was it timing? Was it refusal to confirm to the, conform to the music industry or something else? I think it's or, a little and, of both. I think timing uh, is a big part of it because I think that you know when uh, you know one of the Warner Brothers guys famously said, um, you know, when you know, when they were doing Tim, uh, people thought it was too rock for the radio 
And then when they did All Shook Down, people thought it was too soft for the radio. Or so, I forget what the exact quote was, but it, so it was a little bit, you know, they were, I, I don't know if they were ahead of their time, but they were maybe not of the time they were doing their own thing. Um, as far as why they teetered on the brink, I think it was because they just, they couldn't play the game. And really, you know, the record business, you know, has, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, as they say, uh, shaking hands and kissing babies that, you know, some artists do. And there's, uh, there's some artists that just can't do that kind of thing. And, yeah. um, and, you know, I, I get frustrated sometimes where, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I stood there and watched the replacements play in front of, you know, 10 people in Wichita. And I thought there can't be a better rock band on the planet right this second, because I'm looking at them right now. And then they'd play in front of a huge crowd, you know, in Atlanta, and they'd be stinking drunk, and people would storm out, you know, furious. So it was just that the Mats couldn't play the game, and they they couldn't rise to the occasion every time. And that's that that was maybe a flaw in their personalities, but I thought it was a very honest flaw. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that answers. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good. That was a good question. Patty said. She also said she wants Bob stories. Um, Bob do you have stories. A good Bob? I mean, there's so many. Of them. Just... I, I was thinking just the other day. Um, uh, a couple of my favorite Bob stories were one is um, we had a day off in Ann Arbor, and uh, Bob and Chris, and a friend of ours who worked at the local record store, School Kids in Ann Arbor, went to see Spinal Tap when it was brand new. And it was such a trip for me to see Spinal Tap with Bob because, <laughs> you know, I'm laughing at it. But for Bob, Bob's looking at it. And the fact is, a lot of what happened in Spinal Tape Tap was was real. I mean, a lot of that stuff really happened. And it's, it's, it's sad, but that's really, it's really, it really did happen that way sometimes. Um, What's wrong with being sexy? <laughs> right. Well, right. And, then, and then another favorite Bob story was uh, we had a day off in, in Memphis and a couple of us went to Graceland. So I actually got to go to Graceland with Bob Stinson. And I say, I, I'd say that's one of my t most treasured memories of my entire life, walking through Graceland I've... with Bob Stinson. I'll tell you, I'll never forget it. What did what did what were his impressions of it? Was he impressed by Elvis? Oh, we were. Well, I mean, we, it, it really was. It was much more moving than I thought it would be, to be honest. Um, right. Tommy and Paul didn't go, but Bob and Chris and our sound man Monty Lee Wilkes went. And um, and uh, and we we really enjoyed it. I mean, it's it was weird and it was you know tacky. A lot of it was sort of tacky. You know, the jungle room with the big thick fake uh, carpet that was supposed to look like grass and things like that. You know, it was just like you go, what are you thinking, Elvis? But you know, it was just anyway. So those were favorite Bob stories. I mean, he was just uh, and and you know Bob. You know, another thing. You know, I'm a beetle nut and Bob was a beetle nut. I mean, he used to. Um, you know, we, we listened to Beatle records together like mad, you know, uh, so that was a fun, a fun thing to share with Bob. Bob Stinson. I didn't know he was a huge Beatle. What was his favorite Beatles album? Do oh, you remember? God, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he ever told me what his favorite record was. I think he just liked them all. Was he was it was he a later Beatles guy or an earlier Beatles guy? I think he, I, I mean, everything. I, I don't remember him preferring one over the other, to be honest. OK, some people are obsessed with a specific record. Um, but I'm, I like it everything, but I kind of land at Magical Mystery Tour a lot of times. All right, hold on a second. Um, Stefan says, um, and this actually comes into what you were talking about before, about that maybe them not touring earlier, because they actually were known, I guess, when, uh, when the band first played outside of Minnesota, 82, 83, he's guessing, how were they generally received, and were they well known in other states pre-internet with no airplay, media attention, except for maybe fanzines well, and college states? For instance, I mean, the first dates we did out of town were like Duluth, Minnesota, and um, uh, Stillwater, Minnesota, and then I think the next time we went out of town, we went all the way to Lawrence, Kansas. But that was because there was a radio station down there, a college station that played the crap out of them and so we had a good crowd when we went down there um i think one great example that i could tell uh stefan is um 
was going to Madison. I think we first went to Madison with Husker Du in February of 82, and we didn't have a great crowd, and we were definitely going on Husker Du's coattails because they were, you know, they'd been around a little bit longer than the replacement, so they were known in Madison. They'd played there a few times. But then after Stink came out, we went back to Madison. Uh, there was There was a demand for them, and a club in Madison actually... Um, got in touch with me and invited us to come and do a headlining show in September. And we went there and blew blew the roof off the joint. And so they invited us back in October for two nights. And so, you know, it kind of snowballed. And I think that, you know, the replacements really, um, that was very, um, what's the word I want? It was very uh, good for their development, if it, I don't want to sound too, uh, uh, you know, academic about it. But uh, it was good for their development because, you know, they were playing in Minneapolis so much where people had watched them grow up and watched them go through their growing pains and watch them stumble and then get back up and do it better the next time. Whereas in Madison, uh, they went there and they really just um, they were playing to a new audience and, uh, you know, they really were blowing people away. And I, 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 I would make a little analogy there, too, that. For, to, in my mind, Madison was a little, li a little bit like uh, the Beatles in Hamburg. You know, Madison was was the the replacements Hamburg, so to speak. Um, they went right. there and they just man, they did so many great shows. There was a club right in downtown Madison on State Street, the main drag uh, called Merlin's. It was a second story club. It was run by a husband and wife uh, that were just really great music people, and they took good care of all the bands. They treated everybody like family. And, and the replacements, you know, uh, felt welcomed there and they played their asses off. We did shows there. Nice. I, I remember like the the guys, the people from Merlin's that invited the replacements to come and open for the damned. And so th those were great shows and Captain Sensible went absolutely bonkers over Bob Stinson's guitar playing. And that just, you know, Bob loved the damned and that meant so much to Bob and Bob. So, you know, there's Captain Sensible watching Bob Stinson. Bob was inspired and played even better than he would have played if Captain Sensible hadn't been there, you know? So. That's cool. Yeah. Um, all right, here we go. Here's a good one. Um, do you do you remember, speaking about out of state, do you remember the boys from Lincoln, Nebraska? I remember the boys very well. I loved them. Um, and one of the boys, Phil Schumacher, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I hope I got that right. He ended up playing in another Lincoln, Nebraska band called Charlie Burton. Uh, Charlie Burton and the Cutouts, or Charlie Burton had a lot of band names. Charlie Burton and Rock Therapy, Charlie Burton and this and that. But anyway, I think Phil from the boys was in Charlie's band for a while, so... Um, you remember them well. Oh, yeah. I think you. They said you took you took them under your wing, and you had them move to Minneapolis. Well, I don't really remember that, uh, but I did love the boys, and I and I remember loving the band, and and in particular, Phil was a guy that I, you know, that I got to know and got to be real good friends with. I I, I believe that's. I hope nice. I'm not misremembering there, but. No, Craig. Um... I don't know. Seems like he knew them, and apparently they they had fond memories of you. Huh. Tim Lewis says, um, "Out of all the demo tapes that you said sounded like bands trying to be the Stooges, what made the Matt's demo stand out? Like, how did it distinguish itself from the other demos that you were getting at the time?" Well, it was you, you know, and that's that's probably a very broad stroke comment that I made a long time ago, but. It did seem like that day that I finally listened to the replacements demo cassette um, that I had just put in a number of tapes before I got into the replacements that had a Stooges feel to it. And I remember being kind of surprised, like, why? You know, I mean, I love the Stooges, but, you know, why now? Why are there a bunch of bands that sound like them? And when the replacements tape came on, I mean, it really there was something about the um the attack, you know, the ferocity of the recording, um, and also the fact that they didn't sound to me like they were trying to sound like someone else. They were just playing, doing their thing, but I felt like I could hear elements of, you know, I've said this a million times, so I feel like I'm, you know, repeating myself, but I, I remember listening to the, you know, Raised in the City, and I thought yeah. that it sounded like kind of a weird update of Chuck Berry. And, um, you know, which that I thought, what a great thing to do. I mean, what's better than, you know, not much 
out there better than Chuck Berry, if you ask me, you know, so that's a pretty good thing to have, uh, you know, some elements of in, in your, uh, you know, your own writing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm never going to listen to that song the same way again. Raised in the City is like a hard, like punk rock song from the first record, Sorry Ma. And I never thought of it as being like Chuck Berry. But now that you mention it, I guess the patterns of the lyrical patterns and stuff. I just mean that it's it's a it's a it's a basic rock and roll song. It's a very, yeah. you know, it's a it's it's a. Yeah. I, yeah. It's a, yeah. That's just it's, my opinion, yeah. you know. I mean, it's everybody hears stuff differently, you know. I'm just, no, that's cool. I don't know. It's going to make me listen to it differently, is all I'm saying. I think that's cool. All well, right. Hold well, on a actually, second. There's a, there's a, there's a very un PC lyric, but I'll, I'll, I'll just throw it out at you here. This is, this is partly why I thought of Chuck Berry, because on the demo, Westerberg had changed the lyrics somewhat by the time we recorded it for the album. But on the demo, the line that jumped out at me was, I got a honey with a nice tight rear. She gets rubber in all four gears. And I thought that was, oh, nice. that was very, very Chuck Berry-esque. And of course, very on PC. And I apologize for, you know. No, that's you know, cool. That is super uh, Chuck Berry. But it made me laugh. You know, it made me laugh. I thought this is, this guy's clearly got some writing skills. That is really cool. All right. Thank you, Tim Lewis, and thanks to all the people from the um, Replacements Paul Westerberg Facebook group, which I rec- which I recommend joining. You'll see me over there. All right, we've been talking for an hour. Let's go to Chuckle Balls for some dad jokes, Peter. Um, folks, if you can park behind, you, you, parking can be ho- tough in Ball City, so you can park behind. Welcome, come on in. The bouncer's name is Super Ball. Super Ball... Um, let everybody in. Sue, he's the bouncer. Get it? Super Bowl, Peter? Ah. <laughs> right? Okay. All right. I will be quick about this because you've I've kept you here forever. Um, I have a couple of jokes that I wrote just for you, Peter. Here's the first one. I had a replacements joke. I was going to tell it, but when I told the audience, they didn't hoot nanny. They didn't hoot nanny. All right. That, that was probably pretty bad. <laughs> I'll put that as a no laugh for you, Peter. Um, hold on a second. I, I wasn't sure that was the joke. I, I guess I missed that. I know. It was not good. It wasn't good. I said never. My, my never. My, all right. You, you know, the radio. And Hold on. I'm going to shut the music off. It's distracting my do, my joke delivery. You know, um, the radio in Arkansas sucks, Peter. It only has a little rock. Huh. All right. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't that great, but um, I had a David Bowie joke for you. But every time I was writing, and every time I thought I was done, it to cha- it would kept cha- changing. <laughs> All right, that's bad. It's enough to drive a lad insane. <laughs> All right. I know. Thank you for trying to laugh at my bad jokes. What kind of animal can appreciate its own music, Peter? Uh, gee, I'm not sure. A deaf leopard. Oh my god! <laughs> <I know. laughs> you know what happens if someone slaps you at high frequency? I do not. It hurt. Hurts. Ah, hurts. There again. I know. That's pretty bad. I. Uh, just a couple more, Peter. I'm being quick about this because we've been on for so long, and I I want to let you go have dinner. Are we going to talk um, about the next day? Oh, yeah, we are. Yes, we are. Hold on. We're going to go back and talk about next day. Hold on a second. Um, What does a communist cat say? Two more jokes. What does a communist cat say? Meow. Meow. (laughs) Meow. Meow. And and the final joke. I'm getting laughs. I have three cats and they're all laughing, Bob. Okay, good. I I have... Dennis, thank you. I'm getting laughs from the the guys in the chat. So thanks, guys. Because I'm... I feel like I'm stunned from the ferocity of the interview quality, and my jo- jokes aren't as good. Where do headlights go to pray, Peter? I do not know. Temple. The temple. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to the room, because we're going to talk about... Cause I, and I forgot, because we were in it so long. Hold on a second. Um, I asked you to give me the, a record that changed you know, your life, and... Your answer actually surprised me. Hold on a second. Let me pull it up here. Um, it was 
The Next Day by David Bowie. Um, an incredible album, which I actually listened to. Um, why'd you give me that one? Uh, I guess because I think it's, I, I mean, in my mind, it might be the best rock record of the 21st century so far. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's, um, it's, it stands with Bowie's best work. I think it's right up there with Ziggy Stardust and Hunky Dory and Low. Um, I wow. think it is just absolutely uh, a groundbreaking record. Um, and it's it's also a record that, I mean, it came out in 2013. It's nine years old now. And I, when I put it on, anytime I put it on, it always hits me almost like the first time I heard it. I am absolutely blown away. And um, I just think, you know, it was uh, it was a, a very contemporary record in that if it, one of the things that I say about this record is if you listen to it with the lyrics in front of you, I just don't think it's possible for most people who love rock music to not fall for this record. It is just it's so heavy. And some of it is, I think, the result of David Bowie paying attention to the news and how crazy the world is right now and yeah. he's not happy about it and he wrote a lot about it and it's it's some of the some of the some of the heaviest lyric writing that he ever did um and he also song... reunited with his you know producer he'd worked with many many times in his career tony viscotti and um you know i i mean i think the song i'd rather be high there's a great example that song there's a lyric in that where bowie actually says um, I stumble to the graveyard, lie down by my parents, whisper, just remember duckies, everybody gets got. Jeez. And I heard that and it just, I just thought, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody write anything like that. That was such a startling piece of writing. I, it just, it, it just knocked my socks off. Um, he's the, I think he's the song, a lyrical uh, genius. The stars are out tonight. I mean, is is you know would be on any uh, yeah. best of David Bowie compilation I'd put together. Uh, Love is lost was the song that um, oh. really struck me when I listened to it. Um, when he talks about, he basically talks about ballers. You know, when you you're twenty three. Or you're 22, I think he says, and your eye, you're new, you're brand new, your eyes are new, love is new, and then love is lost, and all it's like all it's like the devastation of losing love when you're 22, and that and and he sings about it as a, I don't know, it's intense, it's intense, and then it switches to, he's talking about someone who's like an immigrant in a new country or something, and. He, he, you know, when he's talking about everything's new with there and, you know, it was, but in a way that is just, um, I don't know, there was something so deeply meaningful to me about it. I don't know if he knew at the time that he was dying. Did he know yet? He was, he knew, you know, he had already been diagnosed with cancer and he was, uh, you know, he was doing something about it. So I don't think he knew you know, I, I think he. I, I think at that point he still thought he was going to beat it. Yeah, and but he's. But he there's a lot. Record Black Star. You know, he. I think he knew that the end was near, and he was rushing to, to to finish the record. And I. I think I. I. I don't think he quite finished the Black Star as great as it is. Whereas I think the next day is is a complete, uh, thought, so to speak, of an album. So, but um, and so. But to me, the the next day is is just like. You know, it, it, it sounds, again, you know, pretentious to say this stuff out loud sometimes, but I think that, you know, music is art. And and in this case, I think, you know, he's made, uh, I just think it's a towering achievement of art in rock. It's, it's a, and the cover is in, intense. The fact that that's, that's the real cover. Yeah. It's very Virgil Abloh, though it's not, I mean. Just the fact that it's a it's it's an old Bowie cover, with and it's almost made into a frame. You could seeing through it yeah. to just the title, and then the title of Heroes is just blocked out with a single line. Yeah. Um, when I saw it online, I almost couldn't believe it was the real album cover. Um, 
it's just it's just interesting. And now uh, one more question about it. Generally, did he play the saxophone parts on that record? Some of it, not all. Because of it. the saxes, the horn parts are were a standout element of the album for me. Yeah. You know, one of the things um, that's interesting about it is that he he actually uh, recorded it. You know, over a two year period in secrecy, and the musicians had to sign non disclosure agreements. Yeah, and you said there were people that were working on it together who didn't, who did talk to each other but didn't know they were both working on the record. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right, let's move on to the um, final segment, um, which is meme reactions. I have some. I have some memes, which I think you'll. I think they'll go over better, Peter, than the um, than the dad jokes did, huh. because I think they're better. I just think they're better. Hold on, I'm gonna get you. There we are. All right, here we go. So, punk or junk? Just let us know if punk means it's good. Junk means it's bad, okay? All right, here's one. When life is shit, but you find a new band that you like. <laughs> uh, I'd say punk. that's punk to me. Yeah, that's punk to me, too. I like that one. Vote ballers. Thank you. But I'm just going to say, Benjamin, thank you for that. Hilarious. And thanks for all the laughs, y'all. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah, that was our example one. Butter watching the other food items from the fridge in a special tray. That's not in there. Les Mis. Principal cast. John Valjean, the girl sitting behind me. <laughs> yeah, man, the girl sitting behind me. <laughs> the girl sitting behind me is playing every role. Sort of the thing, idea being that the girl sitting behind you sings through the entire show. Oh, that's funny. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I would say that's, uh, that's. Punk. I like. And Le- I thought that was. Is, 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 uh, I, I've often thought that might be the best book I've ever read. So. That, oh, cool. I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I read it when I was very young, and I re, I reread it two times since, and I, I, I do think it's one of the greatest pieces of literature ever created. Dude. I love that we have so many recommendations in here. Okay. A two-pack of M&Ms for 50 cent? That's ludicrous. Ain't no biggie, though. <laughs> I, I, I'm not... Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, okay. I give, it a, I give it a punk. Peter doesn't agree. That it says it's a junk. Here's a good one. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. Peter Jesperson. <laughs> have you seen this before? <laughs> Oh, wait, hold on. Have you seen this before? I don't know what it is. No. Hold on. It's from Community. Here you are. You're Donald Glover coming in with two pizzas. And, hold on. Looks like three pizzas. And the replacements are destroying the place. (laughs) That's the the meme. That's a meme. I found it months ago and saved it for you. That, That is funny. Okay, good. Okay, good. Do you feel honored that somebody made a meme about you? I, 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 yes, of course. How could I not be? I mean, that's kind of cool. I was like, nice. Here's a good one. You'll like this. Ah. Yeah, isn't that neat? So Paul I, but... is Paul is John. Bob is Ringo. Chris is Paul, and Tommy is George. That's interesting. Or vice versa. Yeah, that is interesting. I wonder if it was just because they had the angles of the heads correct and they were just trying to... Um, and let's try, they were trying to make some... Okay, here's a good one. I give that one a punk. I like that. I liked that illustration. Cool, we're getting some punks. Good. We got a punk from Paper Bag Man. Paper... Okay. Not punk, but funny, says Nito. That counts as punk. Paper Bag Man. Thank you, guys. All right, hold on. Mandolin. Here's the mandolin from R.E.M.'s Losing My Religion that R.E.M.'s Losing My Religion was on, and that's me in the corner. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. That's me. Okay. We've only got a couple left. There's some pretty good ones, though. John Bon Dobby. (laughs) John Bon Dobby. That's bad. I'm saying junk on that one. I don't know. I don't get it. It's Dobby from Harry Potter. Okay, I see. It's that. a bad one. Some of the uh, mainstream uh, things I don't I don't know about, so I apologize. 
All right, we'll skip that one though. Let's do two. Here's a good. This you might like this one. A forest. <laughs> Robert Smith and uh, Tom Hanks. You know the there's a cure. Yeah, there's a cure song called A Forest. Oh right, of course. And this is just a four. Forest it's Gump. a yeah, I get it. Okay. Right, forest. Oh, that's, that's, okay, that's, that's punk. Okay, that's punk. I like it too. After you I explained it to one. me, it's punk. It's punk. Yeah, exactly. All right, the final one I think you'll like. Hold on, I have to. Dang it. Jow clean, jow clean, jow clean, jow clean. She's cleaning the jowl of that guy. Jow clean. Jolene. Oh, got it. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. I'll put that as a no laugh for you. Oh, that's junk. Okay. Peter. Hold on. Let's go back to the. Pete's thing. Thank you so much for coming on the program, man. Thank you. It was an awesome interview, um, and you even endured the other stuff at the end, which I appreciate you doing. All right. And by the way, I'm going to comment on that replacements poster you've got in the back there. That was yeah, please do. California in April of 85. That says, does that say 86? No, that's 85. No, it's 85, 85. yeah. And, uh, and uh, the um, replacements got a little out of hand in the dressing room, and... Uh, uh, we left in a hurry and there was a warrant out for my arrest when we got to Fresno the next day. Oh my gosh, what happened? I, I, I'm not going to go into the details, but... Uh, you were able to get out of it I eventually. I was able to get but... out of it, but because my name was on the contract, uh, they they issued a warrant for my arrest. Oh my gosh. And I felt well, that that's a memorable... 66 were really nice. Um, I think that there was a... a maybe it was a girl band... Uh, and they were mm -hmm. really sweet, and I just felt like, you know, they saw, like, really the bad underbelly of the replacements. And Thin White Rope, I love those guys, so I I, uh, I think that they uh, they were probably as disgusted as anybody, but um, I think they uh, put, put a brave face on about it. I just remember Jeez. feeling really bad for Salem 66, because I think they thought they were going to get a great replacement show, and they were excited to open for the replacements, and... The replacements absolutely stunk that night. So, really, is that how they were? They just were bad, huh? Yeah. And then they trashed the place or something. Too many cocktails, I believe, is what was the uh, the problem. That 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 doesn't surprise me. And on that final amazing story, I can't thank you enough for spending so much time with us and telling so. I mean, thank you, Dennis. You really, yeah, man. All right, everyone, have a great weekend. Peace out, and we will catch you soon. Sounds great. Uh, let, let me go to my goodbye screen. And a one, and a two. One, two, three. And it's fall, and it's fall. Just a lamp. <laughs>